Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Business Blaze. I am your boy with the blaze, Simon. This fine shirt is, of course, the Ask Me About My Pyramid Scheme shirt. But what I want to tell you about today it's definitely not a pyramid scheme. It's a brand new sponsorship for The Blaze and the absolute legends at Pound Technology really did give me the promo code, allegedly. Pound Technology allow you to play your classic games on a modern TV. Pound makes these awesome link cables. I actually have one next door, which I will show you in just a bit. Basically, it allows you to, if you've got an old school games console, like an Xbox or a Super Nintendo or something, you plug it in, then you plug it into your TV. Boom! Magic! 10% off at poundtechnology.com forward slash allegedly. Use the promo code allegedly and let us blaze. And super appropriately, five fails from the video game industry. It's made a pleasant, and by the way, this feels long, Danny. Ha! Gay! It's made a pleasant change that the intense research for today's business play script has largely involved just playing a stack of old video games. I've also been playing a stack of old video games that Pound sent me this thing like two weeks ago. <laughs> this isn't even part of the plug, um, but I have been playing a game called Prince of Persia, which I, I'll, I'll just show you this in, the, in, a, in a minute, but man, Prince of Persia is good. <laughs> Uh, although inevitably, as this is a business play script, I've only been playing the most utterly abysmal video games ever to have disgraced the shelves. I might not play many modern games today, well, apart from... <laughs> Raid Shadow Legends! Uh, obviously all the cool kids play that. They don't. Don't play it. It's a piece of shit. Allegedly. But I still really enjoy having a quick blast on hundreds of classic titles from the golden era of gaming, when all of this stuff was properly good. My first ever console when I was very young was known as the Magnavox Odyssey 2 in the United States. It probably could play Raid Shadow Legends with a name like that. It couldn't. It was it, it was a long time ago. And let's be honest, like that game. I mean, Prince of Persia is good, but that Super Nintendo ain't gonna run sh these days. Uh, but in Europe, it was known as the Philips Video Pack G7000. What is with all these names? I mean, Philips Video Pack sounds a bit. Sh but G7000! It was quite a funky looking thing that looked as if it had just fallen out of a spaceship, but it probably looked a bit better than it played. The graphics were very poor, and the game cartridges only had about two kilobytes of memory. So the games are usually very simple variants on stuff like Space Invaders and Pac-Man. But my world was changed forever when my brother got a Sinclair ZX Spectrum, Spectrum for Christmas. I wasn't initially that impressed with the machine. It was a cheap and cheerful black thing with squidgy rubber keys which weren't exactly ideal for long sessions of frenetic gaming. The games came on a cassette rather than a cartridge and you often had to wait over five minutes to try and get the game running. Oh bloody hell. I remember load times, load times on some games. I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the, the, I really still enjoy Grand Theft Auto games. Oh my god, do you remember how long some of those used to take to load on the PlayStation 2? It'd be like, uh, guys? Hello? You still there? Only then you'll be told right at the end that there'd been a loading error. <laughs> and it didn't even come with a joystick port, so you had to buy an expensive in expensive interface before you could get, the get to stick wiggling. When the joystick stopped working, you were never quite sure if it was the joystick or the interface that had broken, and you often be forced into making a losing gamble over which accessory to replace. And yet, the ZX Spectrum, with its mind blowing 48 kilobytes of memory was host to some of the most creative, ingenious, and timeless computer games ever to be created, many of which still hold up well today. You've not played a real computer game until you've experienced the full, dazzling delights of games like Jet Set Willy, Mr. Wong's Loopy Laundry, Benny Hill's Madcap Chase, and Horace Gone Skiing. I'm guessing that Danny's being sarcastic. I've never heard of any of these games, so I assume they're terrible. I also think Danny's a few years older than me, so like all of this, my first games console was the PlayStation 1, uh, also Nintendo 64. I didn't have one. So a couple of my friends had N64s. I had a PlayStation 1. We'd go around each other's houses and play the games. Then of course the PlayStation 2, the PlayStation 3, and now the PlayStation 4, which is what I currently have. Also an Xbox X, because I don't even play these things. I think I just get suckered in by video games and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I end up just playing Prince of Persia for hours. And it's like, well, that was easier. <laughs> Sadly, my older brother had the attention span of a goldfish, which, as we established in a recent video, is about three months. And to my dismay, he traded his ZX Spectrum for a CB radio, which he later traded for loads of fishing gear, which he later traded for a motorbike. Holy and he traded up. He went from like a ZX Spectrum to a motorbike. Also, he got older. 
Except then the fishing gear became before the motorbike. Okay. But I did eventually manage to save up and get my own ZX Spectrum, followed by a Commodore 64, on which I launched my first business empire, followed by a Commodore Amiga. And to help further my education, I regularly played hooky from school to go spend the day down the local arcades. Oh, Danny. Oh, Danny. All these years later, I still regularly relive the glory days of Beer, Bother, Revenge of the Mutant Camels, and Ninja Hamster. Danny, what are you playing? The games I have are Bomberman, two versions of Tetris, because I love Tetris, and Prince of Persia. That's what I have on my old games console. So I'm always tripping over this wire. I, I swear, like, I'd go for, like, a wireless lav mic, but then the batteries aren't, like, you can have them and then the batteries will die and you'll be like, oh, brilliant, half of that video just doesn't have audio. And, uh, it, it's too painful. But, so I just end up having to trip over wires all day. Welcome to my life. Uh, however, the golden age of video gaming wasn't exactly without its problems, and not every new system or game pressed exactly the right buttons for the growing industry. Friday the 13th, the computer game, 1986 the year before I was born. Everyone's like, Simon, you were born in 1987. Dude, you look like 50, bro. <laughs> All right, steady on. A huge problem facing the computer gaming scene in the mid 1980s was that despite the wealth of the talented programmers creating wildly imaginative and original games, all the kids at the time insisted on just throwing their paper round money at any old shit with a familiar name attached to it. Yeah, I, those games always suck, where it's like, oh yeah, yeah, there's a new Superman movie, so there's the new Superman game, and you get it, it's a piece of shit. And you're like, yeah, I should have realized uh, uh, this was predictable. Some of the more cunning software houses had cottoned onto the fact that they could sell bucket loads of games by just acquiring the name of a popular film or TV show to slap onto the packaging. When I finally acquired the Theranos trademark, I'll be able to release some Theranos computer games. That would be great. Theranos, the app. What does it do? Well, it absolutely doesn't test your blood accurately, that's for fucking sure. Theranos, the game, where you try to con as many people as possible into giving you money for a bread machine. And quite handily, the game didn't have to be any good. The kids would buy it regardless, just on the strength of the name, like Theranos. And this is how games based on Knight Rider, Airwolf, Highlander, Miami Vice, and Robocop were regularly topping the char software charts at the time, despite the fact that some of them were mediocre at best and others were downright awful. It also struck me as quite odd that even though these games were getting heavily marketed to kids, so many of them were based on X-rated films. The Robocop game was one of the biggest selling games of the decade, yet was based on one of the most violent video games of all t uh, films of all time, which surely would have even been seen by a big chunk of the target audience. I feel like things have changed. I saw I saw a Robocop a few years ago. That ain't that violent. Uh, and it's a similar kind of story with Friday the 13th, the computer game. By 1986, the software, uh, UK software label Domark, which was later swallowed up by uh, Edi Edios. I always thought it was Edios, but I'm looking at it now. It's not Edios Interactive. It's Edos Interactive, maybe? I don't know. I've seen it a million times, you know, when you load up a game and it's like Edos Interactive. And I was like, <laughs> every time I'm just like Edios. But it's clearly not, is it? Oh, Simon, you f***ing amateur. Swallowed by Edios in the 1990s, already had a bit of a reputation for releasing weak licensed games loosely based on hot properties such as James Bond. However, all my talking about Superman, I did really like the James Bond games for PlayStation 1. But they really lowered the bar with their much-hyped release of a game based on the gory slasher, gory slasher film Friday the 13th for 8-bit format, ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, and Amstrad CPC. The full-page advertisements in the pages of the computer press at the time warned readers that the game contained material which may disturb people of nervous disposition, while some of the copies of the game came packaged with fake blood capsules, which I suspect the kids found more entertaining than the game itself. That's pretty cool. Having just played the game myself again today, the nervous disposition disclaimer seems a bit laughable when you see the crude matchstick men characters mooching around a very basic pseudo 3D landscape. The only thing, 8-bit 3D, I guess so, uh, 3D landscape. The only thing you would have really found disturbing is if you shelled out 10 quid for this crock of shit. Yeah, and 10 quid in the 1980s or whatever? It's a lot of money today. The plot revolves around you and your friends taking a camping trip at Camp Crystal Lake, only to discover that the hockey mask wearing psychopath Jason Voorhees is on the rampage. Oh no. Oh no. Your mission is to save yourself and as many of your friends as you can from the clutches of Jason. But your problem is that Jason has randomly disguised himself as one of your friends. How? Aren't you children? And Jason's a psychopathic adult. Surely you'd notice that. Like, wow, Jimmy, your voice is really different now. Why are you wearing that weird mask, Jimmy? <laughs> are you Jason? Sh 
You don't have a clue which one it is until you've slashed them to bits, so the rather odd premise of the game is you have to go around hacking off the limbs of your friends on the off chance that one of them might be Jason. What the f***? It turns out in the end, plot twist, you're Jason. Or you're actually just worse than Jason. Jason is afraid of you. Uh, a big part of the disappointment of the game is that it bears very little relation to the film franchise. I don't think I've seen Friday the 13th, um, uh, but whatever. Uh, as far as I can remember from the films, Jason didn't possess magical shape-shifting abilities, and you don't even really get to see either Jason or his signature hockey mask because he spends the game in disguise. It feels like they just didn't want to animate Jason, so they just used a stock character from another game and dumped him and be like, yeah, yeah, it's Jason. Uh, uh, yeah, no, he, he's a wizard. He cast himself that spell from Harry Potter to make him look like someone else. I think it was actually a potion. Oh my god, who cares? Oh, it won't surprise you to know. Never seen. I think I've seen the first Harry Potter film and that was it. And I have no desire to see any of the others. You get to hear a few sampled screams from time to time, which was a novelty on the 8-bit computers. And you get to see a few surprisingly gory cutscenes on the Commodore 64 version involving a machete slicing into the head of one of your friends. Oh my god, this is for children? Uh, but it's 8-bit, so I mean... <laughs> I don't think you need an 18 plus warning on that, do you? The Commodore version also features a nice bouncy soundtrack, although rather inappropriately for a high game, this also includes snippets of Old MacDonald Had a Farm, Teddy Bear's Picnic, and Adventures of Robin Hood. I don't know, Danny. Like, when they use those childhood rhymes, but they make it sound weird, like... E-I... E-I... Oh... Then it's f***ing creepy. There's something creepy about that. I have a kid, all of their toys make these tunes, and I'm like, if you just put that in a minor key, that... It'd be creepy. But the main issue is that the game is so mind-numbingly simple and bland. On top of that, the Spectrum version was very buggy, as there are times when you can suddenly start walking through walls and become hampered by completely invisible barriers. I would imagine that there are times when a software house is quite taken aback by a surprisingly negative reaction to their latest thrilling release, but not in this case. Years later, one of the co-founders of Demark admitted that when the game was finished, everyone knew it was a bit right. You know when you've made something shit. You just, I mean, uh, I've made videos and I'm like, it's a bit shit, isn't it? <laughs> and then people are like, Simon, like this one was a bit shit, wasn't it? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know when you made something shit. But already having pumped thousands of pounds into hyping up the game, they found they had no other option but to just release it anyway. The game was universally slashed to shreds by the computer press, with many publications thinking it would be funny to award the game an overall rating of 13%. Hilarious. I'm gonna make a computer game that's absolutely shit, and I'm gonna call it Theranos 97, in the hopes that all the critics give it 97% as a joke, and then everyone will buy Theranos 97. Mwah! As soon as I've acquired the brand of Theranos. But the game still sold reasonably well, so it wasn't a total disaster. It's just quite sad to think, of all the kids who spend over 10 quid on this steaming pile of horse manure, then very probably, then very probably threw their computers out of the window and started saving up for a new bike instead. And now, folks, is the time for me to tell you about something good, pound technology. The best way to do this is to switch over to my camera on my phone so I can actually go over <laughs> to, uh, uh, and show you how it works. So apologies in advance for what's gonna be probably some low quality audio, and uh, but it will be a good demonstration of what pound actually does for some non games. This is just a, just a cupboard. Um, it's been like this for a long time. <laughs> I still haven't mounted the TV to the wall. Uh, okay, so what I have here, I'll just show you how all of this works. This is obviously a Super Nintendo. It has a controller plugged into the back of it. And then we have our magical pound box. Uh, this plugs into the back. So you've got your like old school connector here. This goes into this pound box. Your HVMI cable goes into there. That obviously just goes into the black back of the TV. Uh, power on this bad boy. Power on this. And I really hope that I can show you how good it looks because they obviously upscale it. It's not obviously, but what they do is they upscale it to 720. So it looks pretty awesome. Hold on, let's just let this load. And yeah, I, as you can see, I've been playing a lot of Prince of Persia. 1992. OG. Oh yeah. <laughs> I forgot you have to enter the password every time. That's the first level password, but I'm not going to enter the whole password thing. Um, so we'll just go back to the first level. <laughs> and as you can see, ah, oh, the color isn't super well represented here and like the, the upscaling and stuff, but you just have to take my word that it looks super awesome. I'm totally playing one-handed right now, like an absolute legend. Uh, oh shit, okay, there we go, losing a life already. Okay, yeah, this is Prince of Persia. I mean, <laughs> Prince of Persia is not the sponsor. Pound Technologies is the sponsor. As I'll probably tell you in just a second, repeat, repeating myself. Got one of those at poundtechnologies.com forward slash allegedly. Use the promo code allegedly to get 10% off. 
It's a right laugh. Back to the video. As I probably said in the little clip there, if I didn't, poundtechnology.com forward slash allegedly. It's not, it is forward slash allegedly. If you go there, you'll get 10% off. These things are great. Uh, I, I genuinely spending way too much time playing Prince of Persia. Let's crack on. Virtual Boy, 1995. Is this the, is this the, 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 virtual reality thing the original virtual reality i have a virtual reality headset it's pretty rad except it makes me terribly travel sick uh by the mid 1990s nintendo were riding a new digital wave still raking in millions from the success of the game boy and the snes the company decided to turn its hands to the arena of virtual reality too early guys 1995 uh with the release of the virtual boy in japan and north america in 1995 or at least something along the same lines as virtual reality or at least something that had the words virtual reality all over the market is that why is it yeah it's just a game boy what's so special about it is red virtual reality it's like another one of these terms right like uh a uh, blockchain, AI, AI blockchain, virtual reality turbo. The Theranos 97 VR turbo uh, blockchain experience. Mwah! The promise was that the Virtual Boy would be the very first console capable of displaying stereoscopic 3D graphics, which would totally immerse players in their own private universe. It's 1995, guys. It's not fucking Star Trek. They don't have a holodeck yet. That'll be awesome when we finally have a holodeck. <laughs> Although, as a kid, holodecks and replicators, this is Star Trek talk, by the way, it's time for the Star Trek talk segment. Holodecks and replicators had a much greater appeal to me. Now, as an adult, it's like, I used to think as a kid, like, I love cheesecake. Cheesecake has always been one of my favorite foods. And as a kid, when you don't have any money, you're like, oh man, I could really go for cheesecake right now. Having a replicator would be so cool. Now when I want cheesecake, I go to the store and I buy cheesecake. <laughs> I mean, I can call Uber Eats and be like, I want some cheesecake. And they'll deliver me cheesecake for like a few pounds. Mwah! I think I'm gonna order a pastrami sandwich for lunch today. It's like, you can have anything you want, anything you want. But the reality, virtual or otherwise, was more than a little disappointing. The 32-bit tabletop console was a peculiar looking beast. The idea was that you plonked the stilt-legged piece of kit on a table and then sat down, hunched over at the table to peek through the viewport and immerse yourself in the game with very crude red and black graphics. It wasn't true VR, of course. This was 1995, what a shocker. Instead, it overlaid a red LED onto an unlit background to create a sort of parallax effect, which appeared to add depth to the very simple monochrome graphics. The $25 million marketing campaign included a deal with Blockbuster, who agreed to rent out the console for $10 a night, which would be redeemed if you decided to go ahead and buy the surprisingly pricey $179 console. That implies to me that they're very confident in the technology. They're like, yeah, you can rent it, and we're so confident you will buy it that we'll give you the money back. And I'm like, it, it sounds like it's going to be a bit sh doesn't it guys but this try before you buy model proved to be a big mistake what a shocker guys you should know when you've made something sh why don't you know this as customers were far from impressed with the kit and blockbuster ended up with thousands of consoles that they couldn't shift for even drastically reduced prices although the marketing had promised three-dimensional high-resolution graphics so detailed and clear you'll swear you could reach out and grab them the reality was that the hollow vector graphics on the woefully limited selection of games were a bit pants. Setting up the console was awkward, and playing the games while hunched over a table just felt uncomfortable and wrong. More important than that, some players reported experiencing dizzier, nausea, and headaches after playing the console for a short period of time, while prominent scientists warned that Virtual Boy could potentially trigger sickness, flashbacks, and even permanent brain damage? Oh, no, how? How? I've played, I, although I do get the nausea and sickness shit, because I was playing, I don't know what game it was on that, like, PS4 thing, and I'm like, oh, I'm feeling rough. Um, but I get travel sick. Like, you put me on a boat for five minutes, and if it's a little bit rough, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be sick. I don't. I feel like generally I'm a pretty sturdy person, but I don't think like I wouldn't think of myself as someone who gets travel sick. Or you're you're on a boat, it gets a little bit rocky. I'm, I'm gonna be sick everywhere. <laughs> Nintendo had predicted that it would sell 3 million Virtual Boys in the first year, but the final figure was around 770,000 before the $179 console was quietly discontinued, and shops shoved them in the bargain bucket for about $20. Oh, brutal. It's not often that Nintendo drops the ball, and in this case, it seems as if they'd lost faith in their own product before they even released it. You know why? As we've discussed many times in this video, you know when you've made something Shit. The technology had been in development for over a decade by an American company called Reflection, who had pitched a demo to Sega, Hasbro, and Martel. Martel? 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 Some... Everyone corrected me on the pronunciation of this on that video. Even though I said I don't give a f I still don't give a f I read your comments and I still don't know how to pronounce it. 
given zero. They all turned it down with concerns of emotion sickness and the lack of full color. It was in black and white. So sh when Nintendo got on board, the original idea had been to produce a cool, wearable VR system, but the plans gradually downsized as the company decided to divert most of its resources to the upcoming Nintendo 64 instead, which was awesome. GoldenEye is one of the finest games ever made. Uh, Pounds, disappointingly, don't have a cable to allow you to connect. <laughs> this is terrible promotion, they're probably gonna ask me to remove this, but they don't yet have a cable for N64, but they do have it upcoming, and I'm rather excited about that. I don't have my old N64, but I'm definitely buying one. I'm definitely buying GoldenEye and I'm definitely buying that pound technology cable. In the end, Nintendo Rush released a diluted version of the Virtual Boy just to get it out of the way. And while most of the company's incredible success stories are rooted in the concept of engaging game design, this rare feature seems to be shaped around a novelty gimmick that didn't really work. A trip to the arcades. I've got so many fond memories of the amusement arcades of the 1980s, fighting in the long snaking queues for the new track and field game, which had digitized voices and everything, ignoring the rough kids in the corner who were trying to flog you individual cigarettes for 10p because I wanted to save all my 10ps for Paperboy, screaming in frustration as I lost my last life on Ghosts and Goblins, maybe the toughest arcade game of all time, but then still scrounging 10 pence off a mate to have one more go. Danny, you should have got into selling the cigarettes. You buy a pack for a few pounds, you sell them all, sell them all for like 10p each or whatever the modern equivalent is, and then you've got loads of money for arcades. I'd have definitely be the kid in the corner selling cigarettes. Oh, I'm a terrible person. I didn't sell cigarettes at school, and I definitely didn't sell pirate games. Definitely not. Uh, but not every arcade game was a hit. For example, I can remember one arcade game from 1986 that should have never been allowed to take up valuable space, space in the smoky underbelly of the arcade halls. It was based on the popular TV game show Name That Tune, which ran in the States sporadically from the 50s to the 80s and spawned several international versions. The main premise of the show was the contestants had to name a popular tune just from the opening notes played by an orchestra in the studio. But it's hard to see who exactly the arcade game was aimed at. Most of the tunes were quite old, so the kids wouldn't have the slightest clue. And even the most knowledgeable of music historians would still have struggled to identify the notes, because the terrible quality of the synthesized music meant that everything sounded like squawking, like a squawking chicken losing an argument. I have to say, like, the Prince of Persia soundtrack, it's all very like, whatever, you know, MIDI. But it's like, I don't know. It's not bad. It's definitely not bad. I mean, considering the game's like 500 kilobytes total size, it's like, what? <laughs> Motherfucking fly! <laughs> Fucking got it. There's a big ass fly flying around this whole day. Where's his fly body? However, perhaps one of the biggest failures of the very early arcade scene became notable for getting quickly bodged up and transformed into one of the biggest successes in gaming history. And it's a story that delves into pre-Mario Nintendo, long before they started having silly ideas about virtual reality. As we mentioned in a very early Business Blaze video, Nintendo started out flogging playing cards in the late 19th century, and then went through a bizarre period of diversification from the 1950s onwards, in which they tried their hands at taxi services and love hotels. Uh, OG Business Blaze reference there, we totally did a va video about Nintendo's weird old businesses. It was one of the early ones. I think business plays were slightly less insane back then. Uh, before setting their sights on the arcade industry in the 1970s, and by 1980, the newly formed subsidiary Nintendo, subsidiary Nintendo of America was pitting all of its hopes on a new game called Radar Scope. Playing it again today is actually a pretty decent game for the time. It's a mix of Space Invaders and Galaxian. Never heard of Galaxian. Space Invaders is pretty tight though, uh, but with a force tilt perspective that gives it more depth than anything seen on a Virtual Boy 15 years later. More depth than their VR attempt 15 years later. Immediately following the game's initial launch in Japan, the president of Nintendo of America ordered 3,000 units for the US market as he felt strongly that Radar Scope was going to be the next big thing. There was a four month delay in producing the order and shipping the cabinets to New York, during which it became apparent that the game had underwhelmed the Japanese audience. And when they finally arrived stateside, Nintendo of America only managed to shift a third of the cabinets to US arcade owners, who would later regret the decision because of the machine's poor performance on the arcade floor, while the other 2,000 cabinets were left to gather dust in a warehouse. I would really like to buy it, like, in my office. Like, I just have work sh and I mean, I always make fun of people who have, like, arcade machines in their offices because it's like, what are you doing? Why aren't you working? But I would really like one of those. I'd also like a Star Trek The Next Generation stern pinball machine, but those things are, like, seven grand. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. Um... The decision to invest so heavily in Radar Scope had proved to be a catastrophic one for Nintendo of America, which plunged the subsidiary into deep financial crisis and resulted in the US head office moving from New York to Seattle to save on costs. In a bid to salvage something from the wreckage 
the president of Nintendo of America telephoned the president of the main Nintendo company, who also just happened to be his father-in-law, and pleaded with him to send over a new game that could be retrofitted into the old radarscope machines and possibly help him to get them out of the warehouses and onto the floors of currently disinterested arcade owners. President of Nintendo reluctantly agreed. Why would he be reluctant? It seems like a very sensible idea. Quite possibly wondering why his daughter couldn't have married someone with a bit more business acumen. It doesn't sound like his decision. It came from Japan, it went over to America, and he's like, well, I guess I have to distribute this. I'm not in charge. He got one of his game designers in Japan to quickly knock up a replacement game that could be shoved inside the radar scope cabinets. The game designer's name was Shigeru Miyamoto, and the replacement game was called Donkey Kong. I've heard of that. Uh, there's a great documentary called King of Kong, which documents these like competitive Donkey Kong players. It's really bizarre. The main guy in there is like this crazy ass character, which makes the documentary. It's totally worth watching. Uh, the featured. This featured the very first appearance of Mario, although he wouldn't get his official name for a few more years, and he appeared to be a carpenter rather than a plumber in this debut game. The English instructions refer to him as Jumpman. Well, Shigeru was initially keen to call him Mr. Video, but thankfully there was a change in heart in time for the christening. But the point is that Donkey Kong was destined to become one of the most successful arcade games of the decade, selling 60,000 units in its first year alone and continuing to shift ten tens of thousands of units over the next three years, raking in a total of $280 million for Nintendo and it single-handedly paved the way for the country's entry and dominance of the console market. So while the original radar scope may be a largely forgotten and quite under the radar arcade shooter, and it almost brought a Nintendo of America to its knees, in a funny kind of way it's also one of the most important arcade games of all time. The Atari Jaguar, or Jaguar, as Americans might say, from 1993. You can't make a video about video game fails without mentioning the legendary Atari. Founded in California back in 1972, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney, the former giants of the arcade scene, were responsible for such pioneering efforts like the original Pong arcade game, as well as Asteroids and Missile Command Machines, as well as the massively popular Atari 2600 home system. In the early 1980s, they were also responsible for one of the most damaging fails in arcade game history, which hit the whole industry hard. But before we get into that, in typical arse about face fashion, I just wanted to very briefly move to the very last gasp of one of the great companies of the 1990s. Atari was having a tough decade. By this time, they'd attempted to take on Nintendo for supremacy over the handheld console market, and in fact, the Atari Lynx was miles better than the Nintendo Game Boy. Never heard of the Atari Lynx, I'm gonna guess they fucked. Thing up. Uh, it featured full color graphics over the Game Boy's monochrome. But an unfortunate shortage of parts meant that the Atari Lynx had missed the 1989 Christmas markets and allowed Nintendo to clean up with the Game Boy, which admittedly also had a much longer battery life. So Atari turned its attention back to the home console market in which they had been overtaken by Nintendo, SNES, and Sega's Genesis, or Mega Drive, as it was called in Europe. Uh, when Atari released the Jaguar in 1993, it was aggressively marketed just like a Jaguar. As the world's first 64-bit console, and the company was confident of regaining its stolen crown on the home console front. And it wasn't a bad machine after all, which makes it all the sadder that it completely failed and hammered the last nail in the coffin for Atari. The actual console looked a bit crap and flimsy. It was surprisingly small. Sam, do the honors. I did. Ah. And it uh, had an awkward controller. But it initially came with quite a decent selection of titles, including Alien vs. Predator and the best version of the early arcade classic Tempest that was ever released. But there were problems. Shocker. The system was notoriously difficult for programmers to work upon, and support for the promising console very quickly dried up. More importantly, while the Jaguar was technically a superior system to its earliest rivals, the SNES and the ja uh, is it SNES or SEN NES? I don't know, it's before my time. Uh, it was no match for Sega's Saturn and Sony's PlayStation, which were waiting just around the corner. Another notable mistake that Atari made with the aggressive marketing of the Jaguar was that its bold leading claim about being the world's first 64-bit console was dubious at best. Without wanting to get too technical, I'm glad because I'm already... 64-bit? I thought that was something that computers did like 10 years ago. <laughs> Not like something that consoles did in the 1980s. I'm so confused. Uh, without wanting to get too technical, the insides of the Jaguar were a mix of 64-bit and 32-bit chips driven by a 16-bit CPU, so it's not really a true 64-bit machine at all. That just feels like it was a bit of a lie. Uh, enthusiasts of the console may agree with Atari's later claim that it was a 64-bit when it needed to be, but it still seems strange to lead the entire early marketing campaign with something that was bound to be found questionable. It's like, yeah, 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 I got a new Ferrari. Oh, wow, what is it you got? Ah, oh, it's got like a, 
a 1.3 for a polo. Oh, brilliant. But perhaps the biggest question of all behind the downfall of Atari is that despite making good machines whenever they bothered to pull their finger out, they largely seemed content to keep on shifting the older machines for as long as they could get away with it and lost valuable ground to the competition, which they never really recovered from. Following the flop of the Jaguar, Atari reverse merged with a little known producer of hard drives and were swallowed up by Hasbro a few years later. Really? They arrived with a, they arrived with a dramatic pong, but left the scene with a barely audible ping. But a boom boom. Ah, uh, ET, 1982. I've heard of this one. But let's finish off. Really? There's like many more pages, but okay. With a triumphant look back at the golden years of Atari gaming when the console giant could do no wrong. And maybe just pause to consider how they briefly came close to wrecking the entire industry in one limp swoop. By Christmas 1982, the company already had a bit of bad form with releasing disappointing titles. It's probably hard to imagine now, but there was a genuine wave of excitement about the imminent conversion of the arcade classic Pac-Man to the Atari 2600 console. Uh, I'm not surprised there was like excitement about this. Like, if you were only playing it in arcades and you had to pay like 10p a go, which I don't know, is like a pound today or whatever, it's not cheap, I'd be like, I get to play this at home as much as I want for free. That'd be pretty exciting. It'd be like getting your, a, a cinema in your house or something. The idea of being able to play Pac-Man at home whenever you liked without having to mooch down to the arcade with a pocket full of 10p pieces was enough to send gamers into a frenzy. And considering the beautiful simplicity of Pac-Man, it shouldn't have been too hard to get it right. They even made a half-decent unofficial version for my Magnafox Odyssey 2. Sadly, the Atari 2600 version of Pac-Man was a dreadful, flickering mess that failed to capture any of the magic of the original classic. But Atari wouldn't have been too troubled. The conversion still managed to sell 7 million copies and break a new record for the best-selling video game of all time. Still, bearing in mind the critical reaction to the game, it would have been nice if they tried a bit harder to get it right for what was undoubtedly set to be one of the biggest talking points of Christmas 1982, the forthcoming E.T. game for the Atari 2600. But we all know the game Games based on movies are shite. We already discussed this, Danny. E.T. was the dog's bollocks in 1982, and every kid was hoping that Santa Claus, <laughs> OG business plays legend joke there, would be shoving a copy of Atari, of this official Atari game, into their clogs for Christmas. It was naturally a big deal. Following Raiders of the Lost Ark and Tron, this was going to be one of the very first games that adapted, was adapted from a blockbuster movie, and certainly the biggest. Yeah, wasn't Tron a movie based on a game rather than a game based on a movie? I feel like we did a business blaze about that previously. And Atari certainly paid enough to secure the rights, which were reported to have cost about $25 million. $25 million today, I'm like, it's nothing. People buy rights for like insane money these days. But they probably spent a lot more time on acquiring the license they did on designing the actual game. What a shocker. Why is it gonna be so shit then? Oh, well, that's why. Atari commissioned Howard Scott Warshaw to design the game, apparently on the request of Steven Spielberg himself. Howard had previously written critically acclaimed hits for the Atari 2600, including Yars Revenge and Raiders of the Lost Ark, but the difference was that it had been given six months to write each of those titles. In the case of E.T., Atari told him that they needed the game finished in the unfeasibly short time frame of just five and a half weeks in order to hit the Christmas market. I feel like this was mentioned in, I know it's a different company, but there's that book, uh, Masters of Doom, which is incredible, and if you're enjoying this business blaze, you will love that book. I really thought that Atari, I, I really, there was something about this, like how he has to rush the game out. Maybe Howard should have refused such an impossible task. He reckons at the time that he quite fancied taking on such a daunting challenge, but he was possibly nudged along by the fact that Atari was offering him $200,000 in like 1980s money, uh, an all expense paid vacation to Hawaii, and a chance to hobnob with Steven Spielberg. However, the meetings with Spielberg didn't go in exactly the way that Howard might have hoped. When Howard presented his game idea to Spielberg, the disappointed movie director responded with, couldn't you just do something a bit more like Pac-Man? Oh, Steven. We assume he meant the proper Pac-Man, not the creepy Atari version. It's perhaps no surprise that the ridiculously rushed game evolved into a crushing disappointment. No one surprised. That's all. It's often labeled the worst video game ever made, but I don't think that's true at all. At the time, it wasn't even considered the worst game of the year for the Atari SIT 2600. That dubious honor went to a conversion of a little-known arcade game called Congo Bongo. The idea of a simple and primitive E.T. game 
is that you guide the alien, complete with quite a funky extending neck, around a very bland landscape in a search of three pieces of an interplanetary telephone. Along the way, you pick up Reese's pieces to restore energy, and you, and you fall down pits quite a lot, which are very difficult to escape from again. <laughs> Sounds like a right thrill ride, doesn't it? It's vaguely pliable, I suppose, even if it's monotonous, boring, frustrating, and not remotely rewarding. <laughs> I can imagine that most kids who played it on that fateful Christmas day just never really managed to get anywhere with it. And it later and later folds it away with all the socks and Bibles and other shitty presents. Because a Bible for Christmas. Thanks, Mum, a Bible. Woo! Brilliant. Ah, uh, the game did manage to shift one and a half million copies over Christmas, with one retailer reporting that most of the purchases were made by a clueless gran were made by clueless grannies rather than kids who knew their shit. But that still left a staggering three million copies unsold. Legend has it that Atari eventually decided to dump these three million unsold copies in a landfill site in New Mexico. I have definitely done some like a video about this. <laughs> Although it was often dismissed as an urban myth, and the game designer himself, Howard declared that he thought it was very unlikely it ever happened. It turns out to be completely true, though. Years later, in 2014, a consortium of budding archaeologists, including Microsoft, worked with the New Mexico government on a partial excavation of the landfill site, eventually retrieving a total of 1,300 ET cartridges caked in filth. Many of the cartridges were cleaned a bit and sold to collectors to help fund recognition of the burial site as a tourist attraction of the future. Yeah, we all want to go visit a landfill where a sh** game was buried. Said no one f Ever. I'm guessing New Mexico is short on theme parks. You're absolutely right, Danny. They probably don't have an empty Six Flags. It's claimed that the fallout from the ET fiasco ended up costing Atari about $537 million and was a leading factor in the video game crash of 1983. Retailers lost faith in Atari and kids lost interest in video games for a while. But the good news is that this was far from a permanent game over for the industry. When you fancy just one more go, there's always another 10 pence piece buried somewhere deep in your pockets if you just dig deep enough. Woo! That was long. This has been Business Blaze. Not quite an epic blaze. Haven't done an epic blaze in a while. Maybe I'll do another one soon. This has been Business Blaze. Thank you so much for watching. Please do check out today's sponsor. Support them. It supports the show. It supports me. Poundtechnologies.com forward slash allegedly. And thank you for watching. Oh my god, who cares?